It's a, it's a topic, uh, responsible innovation, that is not uh, without consequences. We've, uh, we've been talking already about the prisons of the future, about nudging. Uh, someone already confided that um, as a result of being engaged in, uh, in the topic of responsible innovation, it went, went, underwent a little bit of an identity crisis. So um, um, it, it's, I will use these 15 minutes, 15 minutes to uh, give my take on uh, responsible innovation as it also has been uh, figuring in the EU and in this program Horizon 2020 and it all started with a report that we did for European Commission and I want to emphasize that it is a particular conception of responsible innovation. It's not the final and definitive answer to what it is. Uh, it's, it's kind of opening uh, statement uh, but it's one I think that is, that is, uh, that is re I find really interesting and I hope to show and demonstrate why, why that is the case. Um, uh, there are life-saving innovations, there are life-altering uh, innovations, there are disruptive innovations, there's a lot of talk about that. They change a lot, they change markets, they introduce new values, new uh, ways of valuing. Uh, there are even frugal innovations, some of you are working in this uh, field, these are the stripped down, more robust and cheaper, more affordable versions of, of the Western uh, technology that, that, uh, that we work with and of course these are very attractive to people in developing uh, countries. Uh, there are open innovations which is a way of saying that it's, uh, it's no longer, innovation is no longer taking place within the confines of particular businesses but it's opened up to all the stakeholders and participants and, and societal partners that, that were already mentioned in the introduction speech. It's, it's making innovation an open and democratic process. And now we have um, talk about responsible uh, innovation and it is basically because we know that innovations can be uh, very good to have. We have a couple of examples here but there are also innovations that are not very good to have. So the first question that we have to ask is this is innovative uh, but is it good? Uh, and you will recognize the open question argument of more in this um, so not anything innovative is uh, good. The follow-up question is, are we aiming at justifiable goals and are we proceeding in a responsible way? Now there is no shortage of respectable and justifiable goals. Uh, we know them by heart. Everyone in the room knows them and is actually probably working on, on them. Uh, we have come to an agreement in the world uh, last year in, uh, at the end of this uh, the year in New York, the UN, um, um, drew together, convened this, uh, this meeting on the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and there's a, there's a great deal of consensus about what these are. If you want to know what they are in detail, go and look at the, the program and you will find 70 uh, broken down in very specific uh, questions. The um, uh, awareness that has been uh, rising also within the UN in the world community is that the technology is either uh, an important cause or origin of many of the problems that we have, but at the same time it could be a solution to those uh, problems. Um, and that uh, awareness, this, this consideration is part of, has been part for quite a time, a long time in the uh, EU since the uh, Swedish president, presidency when we um, accepted the Lund Declaration which uh, stipulated that all our applied research and development should be geared towards these grand challenges. That was recently restated in the Rome Declaration uh, of 2014 where we said, uh, endorse that idea. And it states that RRI, responsible research and innovation, uh, is a central objective across all relevant policies and activities in the EU. Of course that's open to the question that is always asked by fundamental scientists, say well, do we have to justify everything that we do? Yes, in principle you do, but there is space for curiosity-driven research which is covered by the European Research Council. Um, so 80 billion uh, now spent on Horizon 2020 and some 500 million is uh, allocated to deal with uh, responsible research and innovation. So again, uh, quite substantial funding. Um, it is, has been good to see that uh, it was inspired by an initiative uh, that the, uh, the Dutch Research Council took that Anthony already uh, mentioned. We started in 2008 in the Netherlands um, to look at these types of issues. How can we use innovation to accommodate, to cater for our needs and to address these um, um, grand challenges? 
And it is actually on the basis of this initiative, the MPI, that uh, in Europe it became such a prominent uh, topic. Um, it also allowed the European Commission to bring together a lot of those disparate communities, um, you know, the technology assessment people, SDS community, science communication, ethics of technology, history of technology, science policy, public policy, reflective practitioners, all together and work on these formidable problems. So no longer little turf battles in, in my methodology is the right one, you know, my discourse is the right one, oh, you have to look at my journal or you have to read my book. No, sorry, we're all addressing the same problems and they're urgent and we better get our act together. That's the idea. Uh, the specific differences of this approach, um, I would say it is an anticipatory. It is trying to uh, address those problems um, before they come worse or they're, they're uh, at the earliest possible stage, of course, as you know, uh, this is a problem in itself. A calling rich dilemma, um, often you don't have enough information about the technology in order to do a good job and you have to wait a little bit uh, longer and then maybe too late some of the design options may be um, gone already by that time. But still, if the issues are important, we have the obligation to try and to find that sweet spot where we have adequate information and, and still have some design options left. Uh, it is very comprehensive, it is inclusive, both in terms of audiences and, and stakeholders and in terms of disciplines, as uh, Anthony already mentioned. Um, it is normative and empirical, um, so it looks at, at the facts uh, and the figures, but it's not at the expense of important normative questions. Um, and uh, the design orientation, which I will go a little bit further in, in, in detail into, which is, I think, really important. That, that is, that's, according to my view, the most um, important. Also, innovation, cognitive or intellectual innovation in the um, discipline of ethics. Um, design is becoming a very important category. So what are we talking here? By this time, you're probably exasperated and you want some concrete examples. Well, I can give you some concrete examples of what I have in mind. This is the, the Dutch Fair Fund, which picked up a, an important innovation prize um, in Paris. Um, and if you look at those blue labels, they all represent ethical requirements. So we need to pay people who are, are producing it a fair wage. It needs to, the, the, the materials need to come from countries that are not uh, failing states, preferably run by dictators and fill their pockets. Um, it has to have uh, uh, you know, a replaceable battery, etc., etc. So a lot of ethical requirements, and they're all accommodated by one design. Right. So this thing exemplifies a kind of uh, an artifact that, that satisfies those ethical requirements. That is exactly what we have in mind. Here we have the foldable container. We know that 30% of the containers goes em empty uh, around the world, and we know that these ships are extremely polluting. If we can uh, kind of lower that uh, exhaust a little bit by you know, making it more efficient and putting four foldable containers in the space of just one without having to change the whole infrastructure, uh, which this allows you to do, that would be a great uh, gain. So sustainability is added to the set of requirements that are already satisfied by the ordinary sea container. So it is expanding the set of things that we can uh, that we can do now in the right moral direction. Tidal energy, this is a proposal uh, to build these storm surge barriers which protect us from the sea so it is safety and flood defense but at the same time it produces blue energy and uh, it allows us to manage the ecosystem, you know, the, the ratio of salt and brackish water. Uh, so it has three functionalities all satisfied by one design. Um, oops, yeah, this is a data center, so you can put those data center which uh, give off a lot of excess heat uh, and put them uh, next to glass houses which, uh, you know, they can use the heat to uh, grow vegetables. Uh, or we can have street lighting on demand. We have just the street light uh, where it is needed, so we have safety, security and sustainability. Uh, or we have desalination uh, plants, which are now running in um, at small islands in the Pacific. This is a Delft invention. Constant operation produces 3,000 gallons of, of, of fresh water, and it is CO2 neutral, and it's affordable. Um, or this wonderful plan of a colleague from, from Philadelphia, energize the chain. So you have to uh, keep vaccines in rural Africa between 6 and 8 degrees Celsius, otherwise the, the vaccine is compromised. So how do you do that in rural Africa? 
Well, he thought um, there are te the te mobile telephones are ubiquitous in Africa and you have telecom masts everywhere. Let's develop a standardized refrigerating unit that you stick onto telecom poles where there you have electricity and by the way, oh, you also have communication which can send signals when the unit is compromised and the vaccine is no longer good. Really a very clever solution, I would say. Or you can have a, a, a search engine that for every search you're planting trees. That's combining a growing of knowledge and the growing of trees. Or you have a, uh, ordinary fishnets that are uh, adjusted in such a way that they uh, have an escape hatchet for, um, for um, or, um, a place where the, the dolphins and the turtles can escape and uh, are not killed in the cold of catching the fish. This is a very nice one. This is a little um, uh, energy saving submarine that floats around the Great Barrier Reef. And it has, and this becomes a little bit tricky, uh, especially for the people who are interested in dual use issues, it has a little kind of syringe and a little arm, and it injects poison into these kind of big starfish that are eating the Great Barrier, the cor coral in the Great Barrier Reef. So it's just floating autonomously around, but it, uh, it could be repurposed, of course, and it's something that we need to think about. But for the moment, it, is, it looks all fine and well. Um, a little bit further down to the south, uh, the Dutch coast, we, are, we have these kind of works. Instead of building parking lots for the tourists who want to have their recreation in this wonderful North Sea shore, uh, we've used those garages to, um, to merge them with, uh, with uh, the sea defense and the water works. So it's a combination of different things. We hear safety, recreation, and environment satisfied in one big design. The Offslag Dyke, the big uh, dike in the northern part of the country, we do the same. We have building with nature, allowing uh, uh, fish and birds to migrate and to breed. Uh, we uh, in introduce all kinds of new renewable energies, so we combine mobility, recreation, and wildlife. We also have roads in the northern part of the country where we combine safety, which is, you know, the, the, we use a kind of asphalt bitumen which lights up in the dark, and you don't need to street lights or just uh, or, or less of it. Um, so we combine, um, um, and they're also uh, noise uh, uh, absorbing, so they're silent and safe roads. Again, interesting combinations. Um, this is uh, an idea that Cola, Coca-Cola had. Let's stick anti-diarrhea kits on uh, crates of uh, Coca-Cola because the supply chain of Coca-Cola in Africa is really superb. So if we could graft uh, the distribution of what we get, want to get to people in remote areas, uh, some medicine uh, and some basic, uh, some med medical kits, <coughs> that would be really interesting. Um, lighting, we know this is the, uh, the, the light, uh, light bulb, uh, it's, it's really cozy, it's very nice to have that in, in your home, but it's 95% of the energy uh, uh, leaves the, uh, the light bulb in the form of heat and is not used, uh, and of course this is much more efficient but not very cozy. Now MIT has come up with a nano uh, layer on the glass that propagates back the uh, infrared uh, to the filament, uh, and so this is uh, incredibly energy saving and very promising. So now we combine energy efficiency and sustainability with coziness. It's a value, but uh, perhaps not one that should be on the top of our list, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's a value. Um, now, an observation I think is in place. This is great only if we can justify having roads, dikes, cola, internet searches, electrical lightning, uh, lighting, freshly caught fish, data, cargo, street lighting, smartphones, all the, the examples in the first place. And if not, if we cannot justify having them, well then res responsible innovation along these lines doesn't help us, right? So it's an improvement of sorts, but it, it won't deal with uh, the, the problem if we say, well, you know, people shouldn't drink Coca-Cola in the first place, then this example that I, I provided is not something, not, not a, kind of a, a simple one. Um, so what are these examples, examples of? Um, I think of a key fer feature of responsible innovation, and that is design of new functionality, and that could be of different sorts, could be technical, could be conceptual, could be mathematical, could be social, could be institutional, or combinations thereof, that allows us to expand the set of obligations that we can satisfy. Uh, and this is exactly the definition that we work with in this committee on the basis of which the European Commission decided to go ahead with the uh, RRI program in Horizon 2020. This is the definition. 
Um, and you know, I'll, I'll cut it short, but it, it, it is about um, trying as much as you can to, um, to gather the relevant knowledge about consequences and options that are open to you and to evaluate and assess those options and consequences in terms of values that could be cost, it could be privacy, it could be equity, it could be justice, and then use those considerations as requirements for your design. And that is the key move. That is, that is an innovation in ethics, I think, that hasn't been done before. Um, so it's aiming at important societal problems. It doesn't create in the process new problems, otherwise you're you know, in bad shape. Think about options and consequences, positive and negative, uh, like health, in terms of those explicit moral values, and use those moral considerations as um, uh, requirements for the things that you're making and designing. Um, now, can we build our values into our technology? So there are many colleagues uh, in the room that are doing that, actually. And if you look at IT systems, and we will have a discussion about, about that later when um, our keynote speaker uh, will be discussing about smart cities in IT, um, they are built into our infrastructures in everywhere. Every place where you can point your finger or not point your finger, they're built in. These are conscious, unconscious decisions. Uh, sometimes they're, uh, they're made with the best intentions, sometimes they're made with bad intentions, right? And we don't know which is which. We have to have a debate about that, and this is one of the problems with algorithms and, um, that are under the hood and that are invisible uh, to us. So all of these places, they, uh, and they're, they're everywhere. Every, uh, our environments are from A to Z designed, and they're full of those little uh, and big decisions and that are that crept into the design. Um, so, and smart cities will be discussed further. <clears throat> so this is the key problem, and you could call it value-sensitive design or design and values, whatever you want, but on the left-hand side you have your values, and, and it's not an exhaustive list, and there are different conceptions of them, that's all agreed, but somehow they figure prominently, they should figure prominently in what we do on the, on the right-hand side, the world of engineering and technology and innovation, and the two need to be connected. So, we want to express the things that we agree upon and that we um, find important in, the terms, in terms of values and ethics, we need to implement that and express that and embed that and incorporate that into, into the, the world of, of technology, broadly conceived. And we need to be able to demonstrate and show to the people who have invested their money, that's you and me, taxpayers' money, uh, that we have done a good job, that we actually have done the best possible job. Um, and that's not easy. That's easily said. Uh, and PowerPoint is wonderful in, in drawing these pi the pictures, but it's a methodological problem everywhere where you can point your, your, your infrared pointer. In, in Delft, we are, we are uh, working with this idea of designing for values and, and using, explicitly using these values as, 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 uh, as requirements of sorts, non-functional requirements, supra-functional requirements, and they need to be decomposed in the same way that engineers are used to decomposing their functional requirements. So um, that's what we, this raises, gives rise to the problem of, um, of value pluralism. So all of these values are all important and it's very difficult for us to make a choice. Can we say, oh, forget about equity or forget about privacy or oh, forget about your human dignity. We cannot do that. All of these things matter. And this, is, this creates constantly conflicts and dilemmas and therefore a problem that we've referred to as the problem of moral overload. We're morally overloaded. We want to do such a good job and it's, sometimes it's impossible. The world just doesn't allow us to do a good job. Um, so moral overload is the problem that I want to do sustainability and create jobs. I want safety and security. I want accountability and privacy. Right? And these are often you know, uh, difficult to reconcile. Is that good news? No, I think, it's, it's, uh, I think it is. Can technology help to overcome value conflicts? Can it help us to deal with uh, the problem of moral overload. I think exactly this is where responsible innovation comes in because it embraces these kind of conflicts. It uses them as a trigger for innovation. It's not you know, sitting there and saying, well, staring the conflict in the face. It's using that actively to, to do a better job. Um, so, and it also accounts for, explains why we are so impressed by these examples that I provided, uh, assuming that you're also impressed uh, the same way I, I am, by these clever solutions and it's exactly because they seem to reconcile and bring together those conflicting values. We're expanding the set of obligations that we can satisfy. 
suddenly by technical or socio-technical intervention. So this is the counterexample. This is an unsafe but very sustainable bus. Very light material, uh, it's on liquid gas, and it exploded. Why? Well, forgotten about the safety. You know, we need to do safety and sustainability. We have to make a safe bus and sustainable. And if we make it easy on ourselves and say, oh, let's, let's forget about the safety, it's, it's fairly easy to make a sustainable bus, right? Every engineer, know, every engineer know, knows that. And we've made big mistakes. And this is one of the prime examples I've talked and referred to it before, the, the smart electricity meter. From a sustainability point of view, a no-brainer. Everyone was ready to roll to do some peak shaving and load balancing and smarter use of our electricity. This is the future, clearly. But we had forgotten about the privacy, and therefore we had a privacy debate, and we threw the, um, the smart meter out of the window. If we could have done a much better job if we had uh, used the privacy considerations up front in a more explicit and more uh, committed way. The same thing for the electronic patient record system. 300 million of failed innovation exactly because of privacy not taken, having been taken into account. So what's the structure of the problem? We want our sustainability and we want our privacy or we want our privacy and we want our security in the street cameras. And probably we'll touch upon that when we discuss smart cities and, and the, the developments there. So we want both of these. Now the structure of the problem is this, the structure of moral overload. You want your privacy above a certain threshold level and you want your security in the street above a certain threshold level. Yeah, the irony is that often we're, we're working with a first generation, fairly stupid camera system. And it gives you razor sharp images of the innocent citizens and blurred images of the crooks. So you have neither. You have neither privacy nor security. Or you have a much better camera system and you hang it everywhere. You have a lot of, private, a lot of security uh, but no privacy. Or you decide not to hang it everywhere, bite the bullet and, uh, and, and, and have a lot of privacy but no security. So what we want is we want to go to that white upper hand uh, square where we have both, where we satisfy both of our values above a certain threshold level. And therefore we need this fine grade, subtle, innovative, smart camera system that allows us to have our cake and eat it. And this is, this is where the rub is. This is where the, the, the smart innovation is. And this is, I think, an important insight and could even dramatically call it the moral axiom of responsible innovation, if you can change the world by innovation today so that you can satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today. Um, but can all problems be solved in this way? No. But some important ones can. Uh, and the privacy enhancing technologies, I think, uh, are a good example of that. Here we're trying to um, to coarse grain, or for example, Im uh, camera images so that we know how many people are in the room, but we cannot tell which people are in the room. So, and um, so there's a whole um, R&D track uh, portfolio in Europe that we have developed because we were so strong on privacy, and now the rest of the world suddenly is interested in our privacy respecting and privacy enhancing technologies in Europe. After Snowden, the world comes and shop, shops for privacy respecting technologies in Europe. Well, that's, that's the, the benefit of being principled. Um, so it, it does pay off in some cases. Um, so privacy respecting technologies, I think, are a good example. Everyone is now interested in how to get the functionality of the computer and the digital technologies, but without the drawbacks. So try to be clever and try to have it both ways. There's no guarantee that it can always be done. Um, another good example is sustainability technology. Uh, the, the Germans in the, at the end of the, the last century had this incredible political tension running through their society. The Green Parties, you know, they were kind of a very strong political movement that protested against a lot of uh, you know, industrial development uh, and therefore against economic growth, growth it seemed. Um, so they were kind of between these two, right? Between Green and Das Wirtschaftswunder. Um, and now they're market leader in sustainability technology. So they have innovated themselves out of this problem. <coughs> Instead of saying, ma making it easy on themselves and say, oh, let's forget about jobs and about economic growth. Let's just pay attention to the environment. That would have been easy and would have taken away the kind of necessity to innovate, to go to that right, right upper hand square. Um, or they could have said, well, you know, let's forget about jobs. Let's just uh, look at the environment or the other way around. Uh, you can also cheat yourself out of the problem. 
of, uh, uh, of moral overload by pretending that you have solved it, that you have actually progressed towards that right upper hand square where you have met both values above a certain threshold level, but you haven't. You're just fudging the people and you're misleading people. And of course, this is one of the problems. Um, but of course, if they would have taken it more seriously, they would have made really interesting innovations and said, well, yeah, our, our more efficient motor management system and uh, sustainability. Um, as, as this guy Winterkorn already, you see, uh, you know, he wanted the cleanest, economical, fascinating, this is what people want. If they're, if they're honest, they want this and that and that and that, and they are pretending that they're there, but they, in this particular case, they were not. So to, just to conclude, um, moral values can be drivers of innovation, uh, moral progress by innovation. So we're transforming the world in such a way that we're expanding the set of obligations that we can satisfy. It's now suddenly privacy and security. It is economic growth and jobs and prosperity and sustainability and all the other things that we want. There's, again, there's no guarantee that we can, are always successful, but if the stakes are high enough, we have an obligation to try. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, wanted to conclude.